So we'll get started shortly. Welcome to our community chat. Today's topic is the North Amherst Library. We'll get started shortly. So we have a special guest host today. Brianna Sundard isn't with us, but Angela Mills is filling in capably for her as our, as our guest host, like, like, like the old Johnny Carson days. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old reference. Yes. It works. <laughs> okay. So welcome everyone. And I will allow our special guests to introduce themselves. Paul, do you wanna start? Sure. Uh, I'm Paul Bachelman. I'm the town manager. Guilford. I'm Guilford Mooring. I'm the superintendent of public works. I am Charles. Charles Roberts with June Riddle Architects, please. Thank you. And I'm Chris Farley. I'm Project Architect with Kuhn Riddle Architects. And I'm Angela and I'm pinch hitting today for Brianna. And <laughs> um, our topic is the North Amherst Library. So we welcome everyone. I think we're gonna do a quick overview. So Paul, if you wanna give some updates. Sure. So um, topic of the day is vaccinations. Uh, Angela and our team at the town manager's office and at the senior center and our COVID vaccine uh, ambassadors have just been hammered with lots of phone calls. Uh, we've made it our mission to answer as many calls as we can and to return calls if people leave messages. It's quite different than almost every other community. Uh, and the 211 number at the state is just is crashing along with a lot of other things at the state because this morning the governor opened up uh, vaccinations to people 65 and older, which is a very large population. And quite frankly, there is not enough vaccinations, the vaccine available to serve everybody. Um, the other big change in the governor's announcement was that they are looking to um, funnel as many people as possible through the large vaccination sites in our area. Eastfield Mall is the large vaccination site. Other locations are in Danvers at Fenway Park and at the um, at Foxborough and at Gillette Stadium. Uh, this is not a path that we would have gone through. We think local vaccination sites are much more productive and uh, more accessible to our community. So we are working to uh, reach out to the state to see if we can continue to host and maybe collaborate on a regional basis to offer vaccines locally. You can also get vaccines at UMass, but it all is based on supply. If we don't have the supply of vaccine, we can't offer the, um, the, uh, the vaccines to people. So, um, and the state is limited. I think they get over just over 100,000 vaccines a week. They don't go very far. There's hundreds of thousands of people um, who are now eligible. Um, so, it's a long rocky rollout. We're doing a fantastic job. Our vaccine stations are doing, are, you know, we're, we're able to do hundreds of vaccines when we're able to be open and we have the vaccines in hand. Um, it's, a, it's a logistical challenge. So I spent a little bit longer than I normally do on that, but that's sort of the thing that's been dominating us. It's the most important thing to our community is how do I get a vaccine? Who's getting the vaccine? Um, and, and making sure that it's as efficient and um, as possible. So anything you wanna to add to that, Angela? Cause you're, you're talking to lots of folks. What do, what's the most common thing? It's been a really frustrating morning because the state is our conduit for information. They're rolling out the supply of the vaccine. And so to not be able to tell people where to find a vaccine has been, I think, frustrating for all of us. Good. So, so um, Guilford, do you wanna start or, or Charles, who, who would like to talk? give a little synopsis of what, what we're the North Amherst Library, which is our topic of the day, which is a very exciting topic. Gilford, do you want to just sort of give a uh, sort of a little rundown on the, uh, the genesis of this and how we, how we got to where we are? I can do that. I just had to unmute myself. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this project started with some interest in the people in North Amherst. They acquired some money from the town through town meeting to do a preliminary study, which has been conducted. And um, from that, uh, we've moved forward. Uh, we have a donor come forward and fund the, the final part of the design we're right in we're in right now. So um, that's kind of how this thing got started. People wanted bathrooms in the library, which there's no bathrooms now that are usable to the public. And from that, this little project has grown out where we have accessible bathrooms, we make the library accessible, 
And we have a small community room which can be used um, post pandemic times. Um, probably about three people can meet in the little community room we're designing right now with the COVID restrictions. But once the restrictions are up, you'll be able to, it'll be able to be used as a, as a community room like it's supposed to be. So those are the th three things that are two things that we wanted was accessibility to the library and um, bathrooms. And we added in a community room as well. So that's kind of how this all started and got going. We're now in the, in the design phase and schematic drawing phase. And then um, Chris and Charles, you want to take it on? Sure. Um, Angela, do you want to bring up the, uh, sure. the image? Thanks. Okay. So this is a view of the of the addition we're, we're, we're putting on at the library from the north. Um, uh, we have a floor plan we'll show you to sort of put it in the context of the existing library. But um, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways you can approach a project like this. The, the North Amherst Library is, a, is an important building. It's, it's, it's much beloved. And so when you think about adding on to it, you know, you can do something that's sort of very modern and, and, and um, complementary, or you can do, you can imitate the existing library, or you can do something where you sort of take the cues of the, li of the existing building and add on to it and create something that's new and has its own expression, yet is kind of very much about the language of the, of the existing building, the approach we, we took here. Um, so this view is, is from the, uh, the Northwest, um, as, you, as you would be coming in off of off Sunderland Road towards uh, the, a new accessible entry with that arched opening. Um, there's uh, uh, the, um, the community media room is, is off to the right, I believe, and then, and then off to the left is the, uh, is the, um, uh, the bathrooms, and, or maybe it's the other way around. It, it, it's, the, it's the other way, the, the, uh, the bathrooms are to the right and the community room is to the left in this image. Okay, thanks, Chris. Sure. And so we're using we're using very similar materials to the existing library. It's it's uh, it's shingle and and painted trim. We're, we're 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 matching the roof pitch, which is a steep fourteen and twelve roof pitch, and we're we're using a durable roofing material. In this case, it's standing seam metal roof. The existing library, I believe, is is plate, and so it has a certain kind of you know durability and 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 timeless quality in that respect. And then the architecture itself is, is, is complementary in terms of the way the windows are, are configured and the amount of um, windows in the building and the overall scale of it. And um, uh, we're just trying to create a, uh, you know, a welcoming, inviting community space that is, uh, as Bill has said, accessible, has a meeting room and uh, has, has new bathrooms as well. So, so maybe we can go to the next, sure. the next uh, slide. And, Chris, do you want to walk through the plan quickly here for folks? Sure. So um, the uh, the lower kind of somewhat grayed out rectangle, that's the existing library. Uh, and right near the bottom is the existing main entry. This is on the south side. Um, the new addition is going to be on the north side. Uh, and the new entry uh, is is uh, on, on the north. There's a covered, a covered entry. Um, when you come through the main door, there's an entry lobby. Uh, just to the left on this image is where the accessible bathrooms uh, and storage and janitor's closet will be. And then to the right is where the meeting room is. Uh, there's a bay window to the north and a bay window to facing the east Montague Road. Um, as Guilford said, uh, post COVID, uh, this room uh, can probably comfortably seat uh, around 40 people. Um, so it's, it's certainly big enough for a good community meeting. Um, and then uh, if you go through the entry lobby, uh, through the double doors into what we call the connector, uh, which is the, the kind of square shaped space in this plan, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a main stair that goes up to the existing library level. Um, this new addition is about four feet, uh, three and a half or four feet below the library level. So it's a half flight stair of stairs up. And then there's also a wheelchair lift, uh, which makes uh, ju just to the right of that stair, which makes the, uh, uh, the existing library level and the stacks fully accessible. Did you want to mention uh, 
then there's the stair down to, to the left of that that goes to the, the lower level. Of the uh, good, good point, Charles. Yes, there's a there's a uh, a staff only stair down to the existing basement, uh, which is currently being used as storage, and the intention is that it will continue to be used as storage. Um, the, uh, it is not publicly accessible. Uh, it is just for library staff. Um, and I, I guess the other the other important thing to point out here is um, the existing southern entry to the to the building, the main entry, um, that will remain, but it will no longer be used. Everyone will be coming in the the, the fully accessible north entry. Um, and as you saw in the rendering, uh, there will be uh, parking, uh, including accessible parking, just to the north. Uh, and a sidewalk uh, uh, going uh, between the addition and the new parking. Um, and, and that north entry will become the main entry. Right. Another thing that's interesting about this design or, or is the fact that the, uh, the addition can, can function independently from the library. So the bathrooms and community room amenities of the addition can, can be open while the library is is closed, so that it, it just it offers flexibility in terms of staffing and and that and how the two buildings sort of relate as one. Um, and, and and availability to the public, even if the library may be closed. Right. Okay, so as we open it up for um, the question and answer period, I just wanted to remind people you can use the question and answer function. You can raise your hand and we'll bring you into the Zoom room so you can ask your question. And if you're on your phone, you just need to press star nine to ask a question. And I see we have some questions waiting. Sarah Marshall asks, this is in relation to the vaccines. If people make a vaccine appointment, but there is no vaccine, what happens to their appointment? Um, Sarah, that's a great question. My understanding is that we've only been booking appointments for the vaccine we have on hand. I know we postponed today's clinic to the 25th. People are keeping their same appointment time and the location is the same. It's at the high school. Just the date has changed to the 25th. So we're really trying to just make appointments when we know we have vaccine on hand. And just to add that, so that's, this is one where the, the weather in the other parts of the country really inhibited delivery. So our vaccine for today is still in Michigan. And so um, we emailed everybody, but also our team was calling all night, you know, all, not all night, but starting late afternoon and, and through, through the evening, calling everybody to connect with anybody who had an appointment today to make sure that they knew they sh should not come in, let them know that they should come in next Thursday instead. And so there's another question that asks if the lift will go down to the basement. Yes, the lift does go down to the basement. Okay. So we have a question from Meg Gage. Meg, if you want to ask your question, go ahead. I don't need to bring me in, but anyway, uh, thank you, uh, everyone. This, um, first of all, I'm really proud of our town for how well we're dealing with COVID and just generally how well uh, we've just made it use creativity and um, can do attitude. It's really, I don't know any place that's doing as well with the various tiers and so on. So thank you, town. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have a suggestion that we start thinking right now about the nitty gritty details of how the community room will be used when the library is not staffed. And I'm really grateful, extremely grateful that the plan has always been that it'll be usable outside the 19 or 20 hours that there's staff. And we also know we don't wanna be sort of subtly pressuring the town to suddenly hire more staff um, for when we're so stretched. Um, I can easily imagine uh, thinking this through and thinking, gosh, we really can't let the public into a town building uh, without any staff there. And there are all sorts of ways we could fix it with either docents who are highly trained or um, I just urge us to do that now so that it doesn't become a controversy down the road. And we really need the community room up here. Um, if we use the survival center on the weekend, which when it's empty, we have to pay the staff. Um, and we, uh, we can go to Bangs, but it's kind of far away or, uh, Anyway, I'm really grateful to everybody for doing something positive during this hard time when it would be really easy to just pull a blanket over your head. Um, so thank you. And I hope my suggestion 
is helpful. I'm not seeing it as a problem. I'm just seeing it as something we should address sooner rather than later so that it doesn't catch us unawares that, oh, shoot, this is a town building and people want to, the public, you know, there have to be some uh, restrictions on who can, you know, conditions or, you know, you can't have it as open all night long. Obviously, there has to be some plan and I'm sure we'll come up with one. Sorry, I should have, could have said that briefer. I'm going to exit. Oh, no, I can't exit. Angela will take care of you. Guilford, you want to address that? You're muted, though. My chair squeaks a lot, so I mute myself <laughs> a lot. Um, so we're, we've kind of addressed this with a door entry system. We're going to use the same key swipe system that's used in public works and in some of the recreation areas in town. Um, and what we've done with the recreation areas is if someone wants to use a facility, they can get the key and they sign it out and they're responsible for it. And then they can open the door and they can make sure everything's locked up when they leave. And we're kind of leaning in that direction for the, the community room this time. So we have a question from Ludmila. Um, what is the reason that the south entrance will be closed? It really has to do with accessibility, I believe, and the, and the adequacy of, of the entry to, to sort of function and, and accommodate everybody. Um, it's still available for emergency egressing, um, but the, I think the focus of, of the design was really to draw people into the north, the north side for accessibility reasons and just for functionality. Yeah, I, Charles, I, I, you're exactly right. I, the, the, the intent of the architectural access board regulations here in Massachusetts is that the main entry be able to be used by everyone. Uh, and so it really doesn't, um, it doesn't, the existing entry doesn't perform in the spirit of these accessibility regulations where only able-bodied people can use that Southern entry because it's, it's, uh, it's got a half a flight of stairs. So that's why we're proposing moving the entire entry to the North side. Um, the other reason is that the north side is where the parking is. Uh, it just makes it much more easily uh, accessed. Uh, if you're in a car, uh, even if you're in a, uh, 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 if you're riding a bicycle, there will be uh, bike racks there as well. So we're bringing Mary in. Mary, if you want to ask your question, unmute and go ahead, please. Hi, Mary Sayer from North Amherst. And um, I agree with Meg on the COVID rollout of vaccines. I'm really proud of Amherst, the way we've handled it. Uh, about the library, I also agree with Meg, um, but I wanted to know what the timeline would be on starting uh, work on it. And if you have some hope of when it will, you know, actually be open. Cause I, I, lo I love the plans. I think they really address pretty much all the, all the interests we had in North Amherst. So thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to run that down, Chris? Sure. Okay. So we're just submitting the permit documents um, tomorrow to the town for site plan review. We're working on um, demolition delay of submission requirements. We have um, requirements, submission requirements for the Conservation Commission as well as design review. So there's a two to three month period of, of, of permitting right now when the project's sort of going through the, the, the town departments and boards. Um, once, once the project is completely permitted, we'll, we'll um, move into design development where we take the, this conceptual idea, develop it further, add more detail, um, you know, start to really get um, integration of structural and mechanical systems um, together in the building and we'll get another cost estimate at that point. Um, then we'll move into construction documents um, through the summer. And so the, the anticipation and the hope is that if everything goes smoothly and permitting's fine and, and, and cost estimates are all working the way, they, the way we expect them to, we should be able to start construction, um, you know, bid during se September and start construction around the end of September, beginning of October. So kind of like an early mid fall construction date. Um, in terms of how long a building like this could take to, to construct, I would, I would think nine months to a year probably would be the, the time frame for construction. So, so I just didn't jump on that. Um, so, yeah, 
so we have uh, we have we have had a very generous anonymous donor who's given us money to get us two construction documents, and at that point we don't have funds moving forward. But we've been led uh, the anonymous donor has sort of indicated that they're interested in seeing this project through com to completion. So that's very very exciting to us. And I think you're right. This is a a nice uh, little positive thing in this in this dark age of COVID to see this project moving forward. Uh, it is a town project, so therefore it has to, we have to follow our procurement, our permitting, everything. Uh, and um, and I also just want to note while we while we have folks here that we do have a um, a, a I have an advisory committee that has um, Guilford on it, um, Sharon Sherry, the library director, uh, um, Alex Lefebvre, who who is a um, library trustee. Uh, Molly Turner, who is a former library trustee, and Laura Fitch, who's on, who I see here today, who is also an architect in North Amherst. And there's a, they've had one meeting, um, but as we get more and more through the permitting process and start to talk about some of those nitty gritty details, they will become more involved as we sort of grapple with some of these things. So I have um, kudos for the design team. Sarah says, very nice design and so glad the community room can be used after hours. So thank you, Sarah, for your positive comment. Um, we also had someone write in and ask, will this project have to be a net zero building? So um, uh, Chris, do you wanna talk about this in sure. more detail? Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, we're we approaching this so that this is net zero ready. Um, we are uh, uh, designing and detailing it to have a, a, a robust um, envelope, uh, exterior walls, roof, and floor. Um, all the mechanical systems will be uh, electric. Uh, the existing uh, oil-fired uh, hot air furnace is going to be removed and we're going to air-to-air -air, uh, um, heat pumps uh, for heating and cooling of the building. Uh, all the lighting will be LED lighting, which is uh, low energy lighting. Um, the, there isn't uh, currently a, uh, uh, a, a photovoltaic component to the project. We don't have PV panels on site, uh, but, the, but the addition itself uh, we'll be ready to receive that. And um, our hope would be that we would uh, get very close to, if not uh, uh, meet the uh, zero net energy uh, once PV panels are hooked up. Um, I, I will say also, it's my understanding that there, uh, because of the size of this project, there isn't a requirement that it be zero net energy. Um, I don't know, Paul, if you, if you or Guilford, you wanna to speak to that? Yes, I think that that's the, the, the size, the, the value of the project is below what would normally trigger that. But with all of our construction projects, we're moving to, we want, you know, it is a goal of the council um, to move towards as, as much uh, net zero as we can. So we are implementing that. There's some limitations in terms of where do you generate electricity on site on this location? And that's the challenge for this site. Right. You're muted, Angela. Sorry, we've just promoted Mary to a panelist and she's coming back in to ask her question. It looks like Mary's muted as well. Mary, do you have a question? All yeah, right, no, sorry, go ahead. Her, this is her husband, Bruce Coldham. Um, hey, Bruce. I'm uh, sitting in uh, and I've been watching the progress of this uh, project all the way along. Uh, a few comments, starting with Chris, Chuck, this is a wonderful piece of work. Uh, and I guess that extends to Guilford and Paul and the town as well, because I've learned over my career that you don't get good projects by just having good design teams or good constructors. You have to have a good clan as well. And this seems to be the, the full Monty here. So kudos to all on that. Secondly, I really want to support the, the observation or the request that Meg made about um, thinking through the uh, the functionality of, of the uh, community space after hours with a way to uh, lighten the load of the town. I was going to make some commentary about it extending down all the way to door hardware and things like that, which would be part of the architectural and design teams uh, remit. So hit the fine grain stuff. 
I wondered, I don't have a solution to this, but I wondered whether the same sort of thinking could go to some way to facilitate self-maintenance so that uh, I, I know, for example, the, we in this uh, north end of town have been using the Pioneer Valley uh, Common House, which has offered a similar uh, uh, possibilities, but it's constrained in all sorts of ways. But I know that, uh, that the community has become quite uh, uh, well disciplined to cleaning up after them. And uh, so if there could be some thought given to how mm -hmm. maintenance could be um, devolved to the user in a way that would be reliably executed, I don't know what the architectural implications of this, but I guess there may be some. And as Meg said, let's try and think about them before rather than after if we can. Um, finally, uh, so far as the uh, solar potential of the site is concerned, my guess is that it would be um, uh, standalone panels if they were to be uh, on the north side. There'd be a wonderful solar aperture on the north side, but that would mean that suitable conduit would probably best be run out a few feet from the building uh, to uh, facilitate that more readily even when uh, that uh, resource was uh, harnessed. Thank you. So we Thank have you, just Bruce. a few minutes left and I know Sarah McKee has her hand up. So Sarah, come on in and ask your question. Hi, am I unmuted now? You are. Oh, great. Um, since the lift is going to go down to the basement. Oh, I, I love the design. I just I had not seen it. And I just went with delight when it first, it, it, the angles are right. The spirit is right. I, I really like it. Um, the lift, since it's going down to the basement, which is now used for storage, does that mean that potentially um, the lower level could also be used as public library space? Chris, do we have enough headroom down there? Um, it's, it is a low headroom space, and that, that would sort of be the, the one determining factor on that, I think. Well, I know, I mean, the, the, the directive that we got um, was that the basement would be used uh, just for storage and would only be accessible by library staff. Um, I don't know, uh, Guilford or Paul, you, you, are, are you uh, in a position to address that question? Yes, uh, good, it's a very good question. The reason the lift goes to the basement is so that in the future, if you decide to do something in the basement, there's not a need for a major change. Um, it's easier now to make sure the lift goes to all three levels and that doesn't limit you in any way. But the plan right now by the library is, so they don't have to increase staffing, is to not use the basement for anything but storage right now. But we haven't restricted the future use if something happens where someone leaves a nice endowment to fund the person who wants to work there or something like that, um, that you could possibly change how you staff the library and then possibly have that for a room of some type. Um, so that's the reason why the lift goes to all three levels. So I'm looking in the attendees and I don't see any more hands raised. We are almost at the 1230 limit. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And this has been really fun. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed hosting and seeing the design. And again, kudos for the team effort. So I look forward to our next community chat. I'm not quite sure what the topic is. Paul, do you have a preview for us? We know who it is, but I don't remember who it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And thanks to our community for showing up. And um, stay healthy. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.